Tag Nerds, Lottie here again. Today we are going over the really interesting topic of infrared periscopes or early night vision, if you will. I am, of course, joined by my wonderful supervisor, Bandit. Hey, Bandit. He's doing a very good job at supervising me. So yeah, we're gonna cover infrared periscopes, how they work, uh, why they are important, why they don't, why they aren't being used anymore, uh, and just the cool stuff that they do. So let's get into it. So before me are two periscopes. These are both uh, Centurion Commander's periscopes for that tank. Um, so they go up in the cupola, which is up there. Not to be confused with the gunners or the drivers periscopes, which are slightly different, but they all work relatively uh, speaking the same way. So yeah, these are two of mine. Um, here's a fully functioning one, complete. They're heavy, so I'm trying not to man to handle them too much. And I've got this one, which I've stripped down because it is broken, which we will get to in a second. I'll pop that one over there for now. Okay, let's cover the outside. Starting at the top, we have our regular prism. It's no different to how any other prism in the world works. It's just like this one, this one's gone all fuzzy. Uh, but yeah, it's just a piece of mirrored glass. Nothing fancy. Moving down on the front, we have basically nothing. Um, this is uh, just an access panel. On the side here, we have our trunnions. These allow it to be plugged into the commander's cupola, Boop, up there. On the side here, we have an adjustment for the trunnions. So once you have installed it into your tank, you simply adjust this until it doesn't move anymore. Uh, you can leave them loose and they will simply rock backwards and forwards, which you will have to do at times. Uh, but when you don't want to do that, when you've got a nice image, you found your spotlight, whatever have you, you can lock it up using that. We have our brow pad, so that's to stop you from smashing your face into it as you are being bucked around by the tank. And below that, we have our main eyepiece. They should have a little um, rubber boot around, so you can put your eye up against it and to black out all of the light that is often visible um, from inside the tank. On the side we have our four times and one times magnification. Uh, simply all that does is you pull it down, goes to one times magnification, pull it up, four times magnification. Pretty straightforward stuff. Below that we have our searchlight switches, um, one for each searchlight depending on the model that you are using. Now, these are not the main searchlights, um, at least not in this iteration. So it's not that searchlight. It's a little searchlight that fits to the commander's cupola. I don't have one to demonstrate, um, but yeah, they just plug into this little outlet here and you turn them on with these ones here. Pretty straightforward stuff. On this side, we have the power in. It's a three pin plug, but only two of them are being used. And it's just 24 volts straight DC. In fact, it even tells you on the side, 24 volts straight DC. And this is our out for such like connectors. Pretty straightforward stuff. On the bottom, we have the casing for the fuse box. There's a five amp and a two amp fuse in here. I'll bring the other one around. Uh, this one's just a little bit lighter, but it's still quite heavy. So there's our fuse box. And here are our two switches. Uh, our main switch, just where my thumb is, on and off. And our diaphragm switch, in and out. These are the two most important switches. We'll get to those in a quick second. Lastly, you will notice this deteriorating sign. These come on all infrared periscopes. Do not switch on in daylight. And it means that in every sense of the word. You should not do that 
in daylight, even if it's not powered on. We'll get to that one in a second. So yeah, pretty straightforward stuff. Now, let's go up again and revisit our changeover switch. So this switch here is the same as that one there. All it does, hopefully I can do it with one hand, is it moves this rack left and right. It's pretty straightforward stuff. This is our one times magnification, which is no magnification. And this is our four times magnification. Both of these are adjustable with the case off, so you can screw them in and out to get your correct focal distance. And you just work it in tandem with this one here. Uh, if you do want to set it correctly, again, this one's all destroyed and what have, have you. Set it to the middle, which on this one is one. Power it up, look through here, adjust it, switch it over, adjust it. None of this is new if you are familiar with normal periscopes. This is how basically all periscopes work. But that's not why you tuned in. Heading back down to our switches, we will cover what they do. Starting with the on-off switch, it's pretty straightforward. It switches the power on and off. So it provides power to this one here and this one here. They connect to this bad boy here. So that screws into the bottom here, that is our earth. And the rest actually um, provides a current through this surface here. We will cover this very important bit in a second. It goes over there. Now, not only does it do that, but the main power switch, this one here, it opens and closes that shutter there. You will notice it is not a lens. It is a total blackout shutter. That is power off. That is power on. This is important. You should never turn on your infrared periscope, even with the power disconnected, because they should all have a shutter in them like that. What that does is it stops ambient light from entering this. Very important. The second one, so we'll move the first one out of the way. The second one is a lens. Specifically, all it does is it reduces the light coming in. Basically a pair of sunglasses. And it is our diaphragm. So right now the diaphragm is in and out, in, out. Pretty straightforward stuff. So we'll just lock them back in. If you have one of these and they are not set like that, do that right now. Um, otherwise, you can destroy the most important bit of your infrared periscope. Put that one back down. So, yep, pretty straightforward stuff. Now let's get to the meat of it. Bandit likes me, don't you bandit? <laughs> okay, this is what you call an image conversion tube. This is what allows us to see in the infrared spectrum. Inside here is basically nothing. It is a vacuum tube. Vacuum tubes are used in a lot of old school technology. Um, your old TVs, the reason your old TVs are massive is because they're filled with these. Radio sets use them. They're a really neat bit of um, kit. Basically what they do, um, they allow a magnetic field to form um, and direct information into a singular point, which we'll get to. At the front, we have a lens, just a normal magnifying lens. Behind that is what we really want to be talking about. That is called, and I hope I don't butcher this, a photocathode. It does two things in this instance. It converts light, so our wavy light comes into here. It impacts with the photocathode and it is converted into electrons, so little particles of electrons, and they come out into this tube here. What this one also does is it filters for infrared light. That's why it's 
a little bit duller. So the vast majority of light that can pass through and be converted is infrared. Without that, um, it would still work, but there would be a lot less bias towards um, infrared light as a whole. So our light has come in here. It is now converted into electrons. In here, we have our vacuum, which this one is still vacuumized, which is really good, uh, and a small, well, actually not a small, but a magnetic field is generated through the electric current. That focuses all of our electrons into the rear. You'll see that cone structure, upside down cone structure. That is the anode right at the top there, that little black bit, which is burnt out. <laughs> um, that is our anode. All the electrons are focused into that when they're in this section here, they are accelerated by the same voltage into the rear of this phosphorus screen. So that's what this is, this white bit here. It is a phosphorus element. The reason we accelerate the electrons is because the faster they impact this screen, the cleaner the image. So we'll cover that one again real quick. Light comes in, it, we filter for infrared, we then convert that light into electrons. The electrons are focused into our anode at the back here, and then it is accelerated into the screen at the back here. If I were to turn this on right now, which I can't, but if I were to turn this on, you would see an image glow in the back here. It's also what gives infrared its green color. It's illuminating a phosphorus screen. This one's busted, which is why I'm allowed to just wave it around willy-nilly. Uh, do not do this, <laughs> obviously. Don't do this uh, if you do have one, especially in daylight. Um, under normal fluorescent light, it's not too bad because there's not a ton of infrared light being generated. Out there, though, there is. There is infrared light. So that's why you don't wave this around willy-nilly. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what that does. It sits in there. I've just pulled it out because, again, it's useless to me. Um, but yeah, it's what sits between this lens and this prism in the back. This prism just allows us to see this image through here. So looking through there, you can see my fingers waving above the top just obviously it's not set up focally um, correctly because this is missing but you get the idea so yeah that is what generates our green screen uh, and it allows us to see in the infrared spectrum so I hope that was understandable I don't know I might do another video in the future once I have worked out everything there is to know about it gonna lay this down for them. Um, it's interesting stuff to work with. Um, I had to learn all of this to fix these ones, which I now have quite a few operational, including the one for the Centurion tank, which I'm really, really, really happy about. So we have operational infrared. I will show a video of it working in this video, so just bear with me. Why don't they use it anymore? Uh, in wartime, back before digital cameras existed, what you're watching through now, the only way to see infrared light was through one of these. We don't see infrared because our eyes aren't set up to see that wavelength um, of light. I'm trying to keep it simple, but essentially wave light comes at us in different wavelengths, and that's how we distinguish color. Infrared is at the very bottom of that spectrum, and it is a red wavelength, but it is so far below what we can perceive as red that we can't actually perceive it at all. I hope I got that right. So you need something to convert the infrared wavelength into something that we can perceive. I hope that makes a bit more sense. Anyway, really groovy, awesome. 
but the race car just pulling up now but it cannot be used today because we use digital screens digital screens use uh, kind of a similar concept but without this it's all digital now there is a sensor in your camera in this camera that i'm using right now and it cannot distinguish between normal light and infrared light so if i were to use this camera looking at that you would be able to see the infrared light coming out of it that's a problem because basically everyone can see you back in the day these were awesome um you didn't really have to worry about the average person being able to see your gigantic 1000 watt lamp uh, but now you do so that's why they have all but dis disappeared in military technology you will still see them used in um, security cameras because they're cheap inexpensive that you know all of your thermal imaging that is a lot more expensive so for your everyday Joe who just wants to be able to see stuff with his uh, security camera at night, infrared works perfectly fine. But yeah, so that is why we don't use it anymore. That's why it is a dying image. I don't know. I'm just rambling at this point. But yeah, it's dying at this point. So yeah, I'm going to quickly show video of this working and I will see you after. Okay, we are in a more or less blacked out room. A little bit of uh, daylight coming out there. Now that purple glow on the back wall is the infrared spotlight down here. Now I've got my, you can't see it because it's really dark. I've got my infrared scope powered on. We'll look through. It's at an angle right now, but that is looking at the rafters of the roof. And that bright glare is the infrared spotlight. Try and center it. So on the back wall there. So you can see how it amplifies it quite intently. So panning up, that's the spotlight on the wall. Looking back down, that's it through the lens. Now, interestingly enough, this is with the filter on. If I turn the filter off, try and do this with one hand. Easier said than done. Almost said. <laughs> there we go. There's the filter off. So the camera has adjusted the video camera. Um, but that's almost tripled, I'd say, in brightness. And I'll pop the filter back on. And there we go. Back over the top. And that just protects uh, the internals from getting too much light. But yeah, there you go, there's our infrared looking at the back wall.